And whenever you're ready, Marcus. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcus Butts. Uh, I'm currently the uh, Research Methods Division Chair uh, for the Academy of Management. Uh, I want to welcome you all, you all to the 2020 Research Methods uh, Karma Doctoral Student and Junior Faculty Consortium. Uh, this is your first session. So with that first session, we're going to do a little bit of a, uh, I guess, high level uh, informational, a little bit about what Research Methods does. Uh, there's a few logistics things I wanted to share. Uh, I'm actually going to share my screen right now and see if it works. There we go. Uh, can everybody see my see my screen? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so a little bit about the details for for this session, or I guess for the uh, doctor consortium. Uh, you're going to have four sessions over the next three weeks. Uh, as of now, or as of, I guess, yesterday, we had uh, 270 registered participants. Uh, that's actually from 178 countries. And of those, 172 of you are non-RM members. Uh, one of the things about the consortium, uh, we love to provide research methods, information, and expertise throughout the academy. But we do ask you to join uh, the research methods division at your next time that you're asked to re-up for whatever divisions you choose. Uh, we don't do that just because we think research methods is a great division. We also do that because the number of members we have determines the space we get at Academy of Management in terms of offering PWs and scholarly sessions. Uh, and so it's really important for us to make sure our membership is accurate and large so that we can offer more PWs, uh, particularly whenever we are back to our face-to-face -face medium. Uh, so just a little bit about the consortium details. Uh, also, uh, I want to make sure that uh, although that these members are not all here today, I want to make sure we thank them uh, for their service. Uh, number one, uh, Thomas Greckhammer is our chair this year. This is his last year being chair. Uh, he's, do he's done a fabulous job for Research Methods Division for a number of years. Uh, also, Ryan Krauss and Sun Kui Lee are both the track chairs for macro and micro, respectively while Sanjay Jain is the qualitative track chair. Uh, also, our Research Methods Division student reps, uh, they provide a lot of kind of expertise and side help uh, to get the session started. Uh, so they, they're integral to us. Uh, also, any of you that are doctoral students out there, uh, we repeatedly have these positions come open. Uh, they're usually on a two-year basis. You submit application, uh, and we actually give you some funds to attend Academy whenever Academy is in its face-to-face uh, -face version. Uh, and then lastly, yeah, we should make sure we thank Karma and Larry Williams, because uh, Karma and Larry Williams, they're the ones that provide the service, the technology, uh, the technical expertise to help us get, get going in terms of offering our uh, consortium to as many people as we can. Uh, so also, since this is the first session, I want to just kind of remind everyone what the schedule is over the next few weeks. Uh, today, we're going to have a session um, it's really uh, Joanna Campbell, Dorothy Carter, and Andrew Vandevin are going to talk about how you design and manage your dissertation or large research project. Uh, and then following that, we'll pretty much have a session every week. Uh, we also hope to have these sessions recorded and then put on our research methods uh, website uh, so that you can, you can refer back to them. And so today, Karma's recording this session. We'll figure out where we're going to house it uh, so it can be fully accessible. So then, as I said, I just want to provide a little bit about what Research Methods Division does, and I know you want to get to the meat and potatoes of today uh, in terms of the, the, the value that this consortium provides for you. So for those of you that don't know much about Research Methods Division, uh, we often try to say that we, we don't have to be your first division, but we want to be everyone's second division. Uh, and that's because we believe that Research Methods really is a, a, a theme or a thread that goes through everything we do in the academy. So whether you are in entrepreneurship or the conflict management division or uh, macro division or strategy division or OB, uh, we think that research methods uh, has implications and applications throughout those divisions. Uh, so we really strive to also be a service division. 
We, we provide uh, free expertise whenever it's needed. We also try to integrate perspectives from multiple divisions. Uh, for the most part, we find that uh, a number of our members, they're really satisfied with what we do. Probably one of the best things we do is the PWs at Academy, where we have a, a wide range of expertise levels and application opportunities in terms of uh, research methods knowledge. Uh, so we really pr uh, pride ourselves on those two days of PWs at Academy. Uh, two of the things that Research Methods Division provides for our members, uh, number one is RMNet. Uh, you, you're supposed to be an RM member to be a part of RMNet. This is a listserv where you can go and ask questions of top experts in the field. Uh, we also are working on transitioning our division website to the Academy platform. So just like other divisions, we'll have a, a website dedicated under the umbrella of Academy that includes syllabi and uh, various measures for uh, surveys or any type of other constructs that you try to measure. Uh, then I mentioned PDWs. So one of the things about the PDWs, we really try to have a good mix of novel and cutting edge PDWs as well as uh, traditional pedagogical PDWs. Uh, so just like whenever you get uh, information and new knowledge from Karma, we try to do the same thing in our PDWs at Academy. Uh, and then one of the last few things, we also try to make sure that our uh, platforms and our, uh, I guess what we provide has a, a very uh, wide kind of application. So that's why we were, are big proponents of this consortium being very accessible. So even before this pandemic that we're experiencing, RMD for a number of years has done their consortium outside of the academy. Uh, we've done that because we feel like we are then able to have more uh, opportunities for people to participate in it. Uh, and so we really want to make sure that our, our community is not just a community that feels like that they're just a part of themselves, that we feel like a broader community. Uh, and so with that, what I'll do is stop my screen share. And so lastly, again, I just want to thank you all for being here today. We have a, a extremely large membership today uh, and attendance today. And so uh, I hope that you get great value out of the session. And I know you will because uh, Andrew, Dorothy, and Joanna are, will provide you some fabulous insight uh, into our topic today. And so with that, I'm going to kick it back over to Larry, who's just going to give you a few comments, uh, and then we'll get the session started. So Larry? All right. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating Marcus and Thomas and the Research Methods Division for being able to organize uh, such a successful event uh, during very difficult and challenging times. As Marcus indicated, uh, I'm not sure, this must be maybe the fourth or even the fifth year that we have done this, and it's been exciting to watch the, uh, the number of participants uh, grow each year. And so I'm happy as Karma, Director of Karma, to support this effort by providing the technological infrastructure to, to help make it happen. So uh, just briefly, if you don't know, Karma stands for the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis. Uh, I formed it, established it in 1997 while at Virginia Commonwealth University. And we've moved around a bit, but um, we're now enjoying our, our most successful year ever. You may know that part of what we offer is an institutional membership program where universities can join and have access to uh, our Karma video library, which includes over 180 uh, recorded lectures by uh, very prominent methodologists, many of, of whom are past uh, research methods division career award winners and um, also as being an institutional member you get a 50% discount on the Karma short courses. So I'm going to be sending you an email. We've got a special program going 
uh, that's called Karma Cares. And what we're doing is we're, we're giving schools a free unlimited access to the video library through the end of the summer uh, as uh, something small that we could do to maybe make some resources available to those who otherwise wouldn't have them uh, because of the pandemic. So if you're not in a member school and you want to give our uh, video library a try, you'll see a link for how you can do that. Uh, we're also in the midst of our online, global live online short course programs. We've been doing short courses since 2001, uh, but finally, in, in part largely due to the pandemic, we've converted them online. Uh, we did a set of two courses for the Australia region in April. Last week, we finished up um, for the North America region's courses that had previously been hosted in person at Wayne State. Maybe some of you would have attended. We did those online. We had 22 courses. We had 450 spots filled, uh, 250 participants. Some participants took two courses from over 110 universities. And I'm very happy to report that the technology worked very smoothly. So in that email I mentioned, you'll also get information. We've got upcoming courses, two sets for Europe region, a set for Asia, and a set for South America. Even though we brand them by, by global regions, uh, anybody from anywhere can take the courses and we schedule them to be of interest or to be easily accessible, meaning not during the middle of the night, uh, to multiple regions across the world. And uh, so uh, you may find some of that to be of interest. Uh, we'll be involved with the continuation of the consortium through the upcoming sessions. If you have any technological uh, challenges or questions, there will always be somebody from the Karma staff in the room, so you can just give a shout out. And uh, speaking of shout outs, uh, one person who's in the room now is our Karma Assistant Director, Esty Gogan, and she's been working with us uh, with great success. So Esty, thanks for uh, your work on the consortium here as well. So with that, uh, again, welcome to everybody and I hope you have a great experience. If there's anything we can ever do to help, just reach out to us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Andy, have a good time, my friend. Thank you so much, Larry and Marcus. I'm just very, very impressed by the contributions and the uh, outreach that Karma and Research Methods Division are making. Uh, what a contribution to us as a profession, all trying to learn how to do better research. In fact, that's kind of my goal all my life, isn't it yours? Haven't you always wanted to be a good researcher. I mean, that's kind of our calling in a way. And by that, I mean, as we are designing and managing our dissertation or large research project, aren't we trying to sustain creativity and commitment to this kind of research? And so I'd like to share with you some observations about doing that. And I certainly want to invite questions and comments and um, uh, on, on uh, the on whatever medium that we use here for that. Uh, but let me share my screen, first of all, so that you can see my slides. And so my slides are shown here. Do you see them? Yes? Oh, good. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> you're, you're one who's on, and, and I appreciate that. So when it comes to <clears throat> sustaining creativity and commitment, something that we all want to do. What are some of the basic suggestions that I have and that have sort of emerged from a career of doing research out in the field, being engaged with organizations and trying to understand a lot of different issues. And the first big thing that comes to me is that for all the talk of trying to develop research with practitioners and with other colleagues in different disciplines comes this point that the, the lightning rod that brings people together I find is a big question that withstands the test of time so how do you know that well you know it's a matter of saying if you 
share your question and discuss your question you, by talking with different people, different stakeholders, and ask them, you know, I'm thinking of studying innovation. Are you interested in that question? Or, yeah, but no, I'm not really. Well, tell me, in what way are you interested in studying innovation or any other topic? And what you're trying to do is to engage a wide variety of people in order to get them to share with you what kinds of questions attract them. Because it's the question, it's not the solution, it's not the research design, it's not you, quite frankly, that provides the motivation to get engaged in doing research. So when you're doing your doctoral dissertation, for goodness sake, go outside and talk to people about what do you think of my research question? And my research question is not my solution. It is not my proposition. My research question is the question that needs to be empirically examined and studied. The second point, design each project as a learning community. My goodness, uh, all too many of our studies and in our research designs are designed so tightly that they hardly allow opportunities for new learning. Whenever we are designing our instruments and our measurements and our procedures, yes, we are trying to develop standardized, reliable, valid ways of collecting data. But in addition to that, design the project, the data collection effort, in order to include opportunities for learning. That includes, for example, designing the study and sharing the design and the research question, and for that matter, the models with others so that they have a chance to participate with you, so that they have a chance to discuss a different way of thinking about the question, or my approach is different from yours. And it is these differences that provides a real opportunity for arbitrage, that is connecting the dots and getting a larger, more holistic view of the studies that we're taking. The third issue, is to conduct a study over an extended duration of time. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, it's a doctoral dissertation. I should complete my study in nine months to a year, which is true. I mean, you got to get on with your life. So you got the best dissertation is a done dissertation, as many people say. But the issue is larger than that. Do you know, according to Herbert Simon, it takes about 10 years to become world class on a topic. 10 years of hard, persistent, dedicated efforts, re papers, revisions, data collections, studies, in order to become world-class on the subject. Now, you and I may quibble. <laughs> Is it 10 years? Is it five years? Is it 15 years? Some of us take longer than that. But the point is, it doesn't happen in a one-time, one-shot, one-paper project. So don't think of your dissertation as two or three papers. Seriously, think of your dissertation as the first phase of moving toward a journey that leads me to become world-class on a subject in 10 years. Now, all of a sudden, you start to change your mindset. You don't think of your dissertation nor your research project as a one-time, one-shot, paper or two, you start thinking of this as a career journey. And wouldn't it be lucky if during the course of, let's say, 40 years of a career, we have an opportunity to become world-class on four subjects. Wow, that's making a difference. And the other part of that is I think that an awful lot of my good colleagues flit and flee from one paper to the next, from one project to the next. And as a result, they dilute their energies, their capabilities, their efforts. They don't dig deeply enough into any one subject or question or issue that brings them to become world-class on the subject. You got to pay for becoming world-class by dedicated, hard, persistent efforts. We don't see Olympians who make it um, not practice systematically for years before they start their efforts. And fourth, use multiple theories and methods. Now, I'm, I believe in um, critical realism as a philosophy of science. 
which basically says that there's a real world out there, but separate from our mental capacities, but our capabilities of observing, of measuring, and of understanding that is extremely limited. And that's true too for our theories. Any theory is a limited effort at trying to understand complexity. If we want to really understand the complexity, let us at least examine one theory in comparison with the existing status quo. Never settle for a single null hypothesis, because quite frankly, it is a cheap triumph. Compare your proposal with the competing alternative. Now you're going to make a contribution. And now you're going to know what kind of a contribution you're making. So don't ask me if I'm making a contribution in my research. Instead, tell yourself that I am proposing this, which is different from what we understand in the status quo in the literature. Which, and that difference is my contribution. So I use multiple theories and methods, never settle for one. And then finally, run in packs. Don't go it alone. And this is not final, but it is a critical issue. When you start thinking about research and a dissertation, we often think of this term that you are demonstrating a capability of independent capability to do your dissertation. Well, that is, should be said as a, a, a demonstration of a capability to coordinate others in the development of the research. Why? Because researchers who run in packs will be more successful than those who go it alone. Knowledge production is a collective achievement. No single researcher or innovator can do it alone. Research studies in the history of science and technology clearly demonstrates that ideas come and go in waves depending upon the context and the situation. And that the knowledge for ideas is distributed in different people, different places, and different things. So the subjects we study, quite frankly, are distributed, partisan, and embedded. We get embedded in a particular community and what we need to do is to run in packs with that community, just like these bicycle racers. The only reason they can get faster from the starting point to the ending line is that they run in a peloton, which is a particular formation that provides wind resistance for one another until the ending sprint when everybody breaks out of the line and tries to go it alone. Another really important point that I've learned is that you cannot study a domain in which you have no interactional expertise, according to Harry Collins. It is an issue of learning how to communicate about a domain that we're not able to practice. The only way I can come, I'm not a physician, and I've been studying healthcare for years, but the only way for doing so is to have gained the interactional expertise to hang around and visit with and be with doctors, physicians, and nurses for many times. In fact, I spent a summer just hanging around following a surgeon in a white jacket in order to understand what it is that he or she does. And then when you start to think about it, when you are doing an interview, cold cut interviews are always hard to do, aren't they? Because when specialists show some interest and respect in your view, then your interviews can become conversations. And the only way you get to the heart of subject matter and the topic is when you have a conversation because formal interviews, particularly among strangers, produce shallow and uh, knowledge. You won't, if you will, share your dirty linen with a stranger you need to have an opportunity to come to know these people. So building ex interactional expertise is also a relationship question to building a relationship. Finally, I'd like to suggest the engaged scholarship diamond model, which I've developed and written a book about, but it is kind of a career uh, learning experience that if I'm gonna do a subject, if I'm gonna do a project, I need to do at least four tasks four activities. First, I need to ground the research problem up close and from afar. Second, I need to develop 
and use alternative theories that address the research problem in question. Third, I designed the research to compare my theory with the status quo so I can address this problem. And then finally, I need to solve the problem, communicate the research findings in ways that are used. In our, our experience and our evidence clearly shows that most of our social science research that gets published in management journals, number one, never gets cited. Hence, it does not advance scientific scholarship in an area. And second, a lot of evidence-based management, as Denise Rousseau points out, is never used. In other words, an awful lot of our research is going down a drain. It's not being used for theory nor practice. For those of us who say, no, I'm doing basic research to advance scientific knowledge, the answer is you're not doing it because you're not getting cited as one indicator of the lack of impact of too much of our research. So I propose this concept of engaged scholarship. Yes, it is a form of inquiry where researchers involve others and leverage their different perspectives in order to learn about a problem domain. It is most important, I think, a relationship involving negotiation, mutual respect, and collaboration to produce a learning community. Now that sets a different kind of role for a researcher so that the researcher is not doing research for practitioners or funders. The researcher should be thinking about doing research and studying complex problems with practitioners and stakeholders. There's many ways to practice engaged scholarship, but the point is you're doing it with others because if you don't do it with others, you cannot be engaged in learning. If I'm doing research for you, I'm into a tit-for-tat marketing transaction. And moreover, when I do a research for you, you have to assume that I'm the expert who knows the answer to your problem. Well, if I know the answer to your problem, I shouldn't be studying it. I'm not a consultant. I'm a researcher engaged in advancing fundamental knowledge about questions that we do not have answers to. And finally, it's an identity of how we as scholars view our relationships with the communities and other subject matter, other academics, other practitioners and students. So when I do a study, I encourage people to focus on these five questions. The first four being the four basic steps of problem formulation, theory building, research design and communicating research findings so that we cross bo the borders of uh, different speaking communities. <clears throat> and to do that, we need to understand ourselves better. We as researchers need to recognize that we are not gods. We, do, we cannot possibly be objective, impartial, knowing all. Instead, we are human social researchers, subject to all the limitations that we are. So we need to know who will we engage to answer these questions of research? For whom and with whom are we conducting the study? We need to know better who is our audience and for whom they work, and therefore whose point of view would you take? I can't take everybody's point of view because the world's too complex. If you're doing management studies, are you doing studies for top management, middle management, lower management, for employees, for the customers, for the investors? Who are you doing this for? And it makes a huge difference who this research is for. So in conclusion, I suggest these basic seven steps or seven ideas for thinking of how to sustain creative research, not only in your dissertation, but for your career, long-term research. Your dissertation is not a one-time, two-time, three-time paper. It is the launching of a long-term commitment to becoming world-class. And boy, that is exciting to do. Thank you.
Do we want to share thoughts or do I just turn it over to Dorothy at this point? Um, Marcus, how would you like uh, we, to run this? Well, we can do it this any way you would like. Take, let's do it this way. Let's uh, kick it over to Dorothy. We'll do, we'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, also, I've encouraged the participants that if they have questions to put them in the chat and I'm kind of taking tabs on those, okay? So uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and move to, we'll move to our next person. Uh, then at the end, I'll kind of be in charge of uh, tabulating the questions and I can kick them to each respective uh, presenter. Excellent, thank you. All right, so Dorothy, I think you can continue next. Great, can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Um, so first of all, I want us to acknowledge how wonderful and you know so much wisdom was presented in this in Andy's presentation. And I'm going to try to build on some of these ideas. I agree with basically every bit of advice that he provided. So uh, that's a really good start to your doctoral consortium this summer. Um, so we were we were asked to talk about the designing and managing of your dissertation or large research project. Uh, just to give a little bit of background about me in case uh, you're interested. So I'm have my PhD in industrial organizational psychology from Georgia Tech uh, four years ago in spring 2016. I've been an assistant professor at UGA since fall 2015 to present day. And I lead a laboratory called the Leadership Innovation Networks and Collaboration Lab. So you can take a look at our research on that website if you'd like to. But uh, overall, what we do in the Link Lab is we focus on teamwork and collaboration uh, and leadership across a, several different organizational settings. So our lab, all of us are interested in how do people work together in organizational context, but we're applying and investigating these concepts across different contexts such as healthcare, space exploration, um, scientific collaboration, the military and corporate organizations. Uh, so, you know, and when we're thinking about designing your dissertation, I wanted to point out that probably the best idea here is to not think about your dissertation as a quote unquote big project. It certainly may be the biggest project you've done so far, but don't think of it as this is gonna to need to save the world. Uh, as Annie pointed out, it's really an opportunity for you to potentially continue on with the research that you've been thinking about since maybe the first year of grad school um, and hopefully you're going to be able to continue that line of inquiry into the future. Uh, that doesn't happen for everyone. Sometimes your dissertation is the end of a, a particular chapter in terms of your research life. Uh, it's sometimes an opportunity for you to hyper specialize in something. Uh, many of us are interested in research methods here. So it might be an opportunity for you to specialize in a particular research method, particular concept or construct that maybe your advisor isn't as, a, as into as you. I don't really recommend it's an opportunity to start something completely brand new. Uh, again, we've got to be re realistic about your timeline, about your resources, your interests and your capabilities at this moment, and certainly your, your committee's expectations. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that your dissertation is, you know, especially if you're a research active graduate student, uh, working on many projects, um, thinking about, you know, the, the theories or constructs that you're interested in, your dissertation is one of many projects in your long research career, hopefully. It doesn't have to define your entire career. For most of us, for most of us it doesn't. Uh, some people do have these dissertations that kind of, you know, become world famous and turn into an amazing publication, but many of us, you know, it's a, it's a learning experience along the way to becoming an expert, as Andy pointed out. Sometimes it takes a decade or more to really become an expert in something. <clears throat> so I wanted us to start thinking a little bit beyond just your dissertation and really be thinking about kind of who you are and what you want to be and you know what does what your long-term career look like. Uh, so I started compiling advice that I've been given. So you know, I, I finished my PhD four years ago and I've been lucky to have received lots of advice from a lot of really great people that I highly respect who have had great careers themselves. So here's some just kind of general good advice that I compiled. So keeping your head down and publish, 
is kind of a no brainer um, in terms of working in an academic context. I work with a sense of urgency, submit publications and resubmit them, even if you know they were rejected. Uh, stay out of departmental politics and be nice to your colleagues. Uh, and being proactive about seeking out the opportunities that you want rather than looking for the ones left over. However, I continued compiling the advice that I've been given. And I started realizing that there's actually a lot of advice that I've been given that is a little bit uh, competing. Like it doesn't, it doesn't completely match up. Uh, so for example, I've been told publish in these five top journals and publish broadly across disciplines. Do interdisciplinary research. Don't do interdisciplinary research. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't take on too many projects. Attend lots of conferences. Don't attend lots of conferences. Pursue grant funding. Don't pursue grant funding. Spend time helping others. Don't spend time helping others. Mentor students. Don't mentor students until after tenure. Be in the office from nine to five and work wherever and wherever you're most productive. So again, all of these bits of advice came from people that I personally strongly respect. They've had great careers themselves and they're speaking from their own personal experience. Um, and I wanted to add this disclaimer of what you should be emphasizing is often going to depend on your particular subdiscipline or your department. Uh, but when you're trying to make sense of all of this kind of confusing advice that you're going to get throughout, you know, especially throughout grad school and throughout your, your first tenure track job uh, or your first job in any research context, is to really remember that it is your career and you should be thinking about yourself as a small business owner or entrepreneur starting immediately you know what whatever year you are in graduate school you're starting to prepare for your dissertation potentially uh, so what is it that you want to contribute and so you should be investing in what matters to you and of course this is going to require that you do take some time to do some self-reflection and figure it out like, who are you uh, in order to figure out where you want to become in 10 years, what, what kind of expert do you want to be? And at the point when you finish your dissertation, there's certainly an identity shift that happens when you add that word doctor at the beginning of your name. Uh, so you're gonna to need to think, especially at that point of what is your identity now? How do you need it to shift now that you're not a graduate student? What aspects of your grad school training do you wanna keep versus leave behind? And, you know, what are you trained to do and how can you capitalize on that right now in the short term while also thinking long term and building the skills and opportunities you want to have later. And this is going to force you, at least it did for me, uh, to think about logistics. You know, what do you want your daily life to look like? How are you going to balance your time? What are your milestones? Do you want to take on students? What kind of mentor? Again, a lot of these decisions will be based on what department or job you end up in. But kind of more importantly is to thinking about these like bigger questions. So what is it that you value? <clears throat> and, you know, in, I think we're all aware of a lot of the challenges that the world and society is facing are facing right now. Uh, so how can you use the skills that you're gaining in graduate school and the expertise that you're developing to make a positive impact on your field, your program, your university and society at large. And then back to Andy's point, what are the big questions that you want to answer? I think this is maybe the most important uh, element of developing who, what your identity is going to be. And can you convince other people that those big questions are interesting and important? So borrowing slides from the previous presentation, again, I think all of these are, are particularly important. They really resonated with me. <clears throat> these two in particular uh, reflect kind of my choices in terms of my career, addressing big questions that stand with, with, with stand the test of time, and also run in packs, don't go it alone. Uh, and I wanna point out that a lot of times when you really take seriously this challenge of addressing big questions, uh, that's when it's gonna lead you to undertake big projects that uh, require running in packs. They require using multiple theories and multiple methods. They require you running it by many different people and uh, developing interactional expertise across different disciplines or different areas. And they require an extended duration of time. Uh, I just wanted to give you two examples of this in my own uh, program of research and in my own lab. 
So the first example is that uh, right out of graduate school, I was publishing papers with a, a relatively large pack of researchers from multiple disciplines who all had overlapping research interests particularly in teams and multi-team systems and leadership and networks. Um, and we had a track record of working together in various configurations. So not all of us had worked together all at the same time, but we had worked on different publications or different sub-projects over the past several years. Uh, and we noticed a, what's called a request for proposals from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration or NASA. Uh, NASA had identified a need for more research to better understand how they would deal with team-to-team -team communication issues during long duration space flight exploration missions to places like Mars. And so they, they put out a research, uh, a request for proposals for research, um, and we answered that and were awarded the, the project. And then for the past several years, we've been working together on a, a really large project that's iterative and leverages multiple different methods so we're using archival analyses and these observations agent-based modeling laboratory studies um, and it is such a kind of big undertaking that what we're doing is we're leveraging a divide and conquer project management strategy with you know key boundary spanners across different subgroups but our our ultimate goal is to work with nasa rather than just for nasa as Andy pointed out uh, to to understand the collaboration that's going to happen in these long duration missions and deliver a countermeasure or a set of interventions that can help them uh, work together more effectively. The other example of big questions leading to big, big uh, projects is um, I was also working with a smaller pack of researchers, uh, Chris and Colin Lester at the University of Houston. John Busenbark, who you'll actually hear from next week in the in the next session here in the Research Methods Division. Um, and we were particularly interested in the context of multi-team systems at, in the upper echelons of organizations, so the top management team and middle managers, and also the way that uh, informal social networks play a role in how strategy is developed and implemented in organizations. And so this is a very different example of a, a big question project in that in this case in the nasa case we responded to uh, we as a research team responded to a request for proposal nasa had already identified the big question that they wanted answered whereas in this case we had to, to uh, propose that we had a big question that was important and needed to be answered And I just wanted to kind of go through, uh, I think Andy really clarified how we need to be thinking about progressing through our research program on a long term. Um, but with these two ongoing big projects that we've got going on in the, in the link lab, uh, we've definitely learned some lessons about managing and um, keeping track of large problems. So the first one that I think is important to keep in mind here is, that it's important to keep a clear overarching vision you know we have these big important research questions that we're addressing however making flexible plans is important with both of those projects we've certainly had to adapt over the past several months related to our data collection and our survey approach uh, with this um, nsf project in particular we are surveying top level leaders so it's the ceo the top management team and middle managers and in order to maintain our really in order to continue to add value to these organizations we altered our survey and made it a little bit more focused on how the organization is adapting uh, in the context of um, covid it's important to conduct quarterly audits so having check-ins to meet are we meeting the objectives how should we be adapting our plans uh, it's important to make responsibilities and expectations very clear. In both of those projects I was talking about, those are relatively large teams, and they come from different areas of people come from different areas of expertise. They have different norms, potentially different, very different work styles sometimes. So clarifying those expectations is very important in terms of managing your team. And never lose sight of your publications, particularly important for junior scholars. Uh, advancing science is the number one priority for all of these projects, and science won't advance unless the findings, the findings are communicated. 
However, particularly in large projects that are interdisciplinary, where people have different norms, uh, there are, you know, a variety of publication standards and variety of publication uh, journal outlets that are emphasized in people's departments. So it's important to establish the clear norms for how we're going to how we're going to deal with those differences between researchers and between groups. Uh, one thing that we've certainly found throughout all of these projects and uh, that I think is becoming even more important as all of us move to, you know, 100% virtual work is that it's important to establish shared technology norms. So here's a list of norms that we have in, in our projects uh, using Slack for instant messaging for quick messages. We use Zoom for video calls. Uh, we use emails for longer detailed messages. Uh, Google Docs for note taking. And we always try to consider meeting frequency agenda and invite very carefully. And then finally, it's just important to kind of leverage our best practices from management research in our own research uh, activities. So thinking about thinking very critically about selection or team assembly. So who has the right skills for the project, but also who do you work well with? How can you establish a team that's going to have a positive environment? Uh, critical to establish these norms related to technology, publications, meetings, etc. Uh, big projects can certainly be big opportunities for graduate students in terms of project development or project management skills, data analysis, etc. But you as the leader of a team uh, need to remember that it's still a learning situation for graduate students and you're still the person on the hook potentially to uh, make sure that things actually progress. And then finally, uh, it's again, particularly in, in interdisciplinary teams or teams comprised of people from different departments, it's in, important to really understand everybody's unique priorities, like what is it that they are actually reinforced for in their own area, and be respectful of those, and making sure that the, the project is generating wins, you know, publications or whatever it is that uh, match up with team members' priorities. So those are just some of the lessons learned that we've learned so far, and hopefully we'll continue learning them over the next several years. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to pass it over to Joanna. All right. Thank you, Dor Dorothy. And if anyone has, uh, if you have questions for Dorothy, uh, put them in the chat uh, or also at the end, I'll allow some Q&A time that you can ask them directly so we can hear your, so we can hear everyone's beautiful voices. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, perfect. Yes. So um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And I really enjoyed listening to both Andy and Dorothy. I think our presentations really dovetail really nicely uh, with each other, even though we didn't coordinate. I think they go very well together. Um, and like them, I think I'm going to focus a little bit on the big picture. So kind of how you want to manage your research uh, projects, but also thinking about how you want to manage your research portfolio and how you want to manage uh, your career. So uh, just briefly about me, um, I graduated from Texas A&M in um, eight years ago. So this is kind of where my big bias comes from is a big research school, very large PhD program, uh, very outcome focused. Um, I've published in a wide range of outlets, uh, which I really appreciate. So in addition to, to our major uh, journals, I've published in some specific disciplinary journals like Journal of International Business Studies, um, Entrepreneurship Theory of Practice. Uh, I've published in ORM a couple of times. I've worked with uh, many, many different co-authors across teams. Uh, I counted this last night looking at my CV and it's over 25 different individuals. So uh, I tend to sort of um, jump from one team to the next depending on the, what the project needs. I've also worked with very different theories and methods. Um, mostly I started out on the deductive side. Most of my projects uh, I'm working on currently are on the abductive side. So I use different methods, again, depending on what uh, what the research question requires. And I've worked with people in different areas and disciplines, not quite as diverse as Dorothy, but uh, I've worked with people in finance, in law, in statistics, uh, including to people um, w within different areas of management. 
Uh, so this is kind of where some of the, the lessons learned come from. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about managing yourself in projects. And as I was thinking about this, I think four things that I think are important to keep in mind are focus, motivation, follow through, and how we deal with failure. Um, so a little bit of note of focus. Um, this is, um, I guess, going back to my experience, I don't think I was focused enough early enough uh, in my career. Those first few years as a PhD student, um, I started a lot of projects. I was very motivated to get going. And I probably wasn't as deliberate in the projects that I was choosing. Uh, a friend of mine uses this uh, Q-tip acronym to evaluate people uh, when they go up for tenure. And it kind of helped me to think about my career and how I want to position myself where in, in a few years, hopefully, I'll submit my packet for a full professor. And that's a quantity of uh, publications, thematic uh, relevance or a theme to your publications, individual effort, so making sure you have enough projects that you're leading and you're not just a later author, and publication quality. And I think we're really focused early on as we're uh, working up to uh, working towards our tenure on publication quality and quantity. And sometimes we don't think enough uh, about the theme that ties our research together. Uh, like Andy said, you want to develop an expertise in the field. You want to be known as an expert on something. It can be one one thing, two things, you're not gonna be an expert on 10 different things. So uh, just like a top level athlete, most of us are specialists in one discipline. And there are very few heptathletes or decathletes. Most, most of us need to specialize. Um, how I tend to focus on my work is I'm very visual. So I like to look at my CV uh, and think about, kind of do a thought experiment. What do I want my CV to look like in five years? Uh, if that's the goal, what do I want it to look like in one year? And given that, what do I want to do this semester? And um, I literally take out Excel, I put in my goals for each month, for each week, and try to be very systematic about it. Because when you're working on a lot of projects, like I tend to do, it's kind of easy to get lost uh, and keep um, good track of everything. Uh, also look for build up in different sections of your research part pipeline. So I know people that are great at early stage projects. They get very excited, they start many projects, uh, but they never really proceed past uh, maybe data collection or analysis. So I actually tend to keep them in different buckets on my CV. I have a line for early stage, uh, for data analysis and drafting, working manuscripts, and under review. And I try to see, you know, are there only one or two things under review, but I have five working manuscripts. Okay, this semester, the time for me to get these things under review or maybe oh all of a sudden i only have one early stage project it's time to um, talk to some people and maybe talk about some ideas and start replenishing that early section of my pipeline um, motivation so as we know internal motivation is key but i found that not all project related tasks are equally fun so you learn uh, yourself, you learn what you like, what you dislike. Uh, for me, I love editing and polishing manuscripts. I love the, the craft of writing, uh, but I hate uh, the early drafts and especially writing method sections. They tend to be very formulaic, very dry. So it's something I kind of have to force myself to do. And I think having some external motivation at this more micro level can be helpful. Um, so something we started uh, in my school um, this summer as we realized that, you know, we're not going into the office, our building is actually still closed, we're not seeing each other, it's very easy to kind of forget about, you know, that research still needs to be going and uh, we need to be sort of socially account accountable. I think it helps to have some kind of social pressure, um, you know, chatting about research in the hallway. Uh, so we tried to create that by having this research roundtable, and every other week uh, we get together on Zoom informally. Um, each one of us picked uh, a project that we want to make serious advancement on over the summer. Uh, and each time we talk about this is, you know, this is my goal for the next two weeks. This is what I'm planning to do. Uh, and then we start next week, we talk about where we accomplished it, what are the goals for the next two weeks. Uh, and it's kind of fun uh, in a lot of ways. One, uh, you keep moving projects along, but you also are very, I think, emotionally invested in the projects of your fellow colleagues and PhD students. So uh, something to think about. Um, small rewards for yourself. So, 
um, you know, if I finish this section, I'm going to read a book for 30 minutes. So tie small rewards to small tags, bit bigger rewards to big tasks. So I found with these things, I really just don't like doing. Starting is most of the battle. It's just getting over that mental hump of doing something that I just don't particularly enjoy, even though I love research. Like I said, some tasks are, are less pleasant than others. Uh, in terms of follow through, uh, document and back up everything. That includes your data, your code, your analyses, your manuscript versions. Uh, you will inevitably lose a computer at some point. So you need to make sure that this lives somewhere in the cloud where um, you know, nobody can touch it and you're not going to lose it. I was definitely not good enough about this with all my projects. And now I have people emailing me saying, you know, I'm trying to recreate your measure from this paper. Uh, could you send me your code? And I realized, you know, I don't have the code. I can't find it. So this one paper has been bugging me for a long time. So definitely make sure that uh, you back everything up because otherwise you're going to have to recreate the work like I've had to do to help other people that are trying to replicate your work. So uh, save yourself the work, make sure you have everything backed up. Um, don't get stuck for weeks. And if you get stuck, ask for help. So I've had people kind of reemerge after a month saying, no, I've been trying to do this uh, and I really need help. And it's something we could have solved together in a matter of 15 minutes. Um, also know when to cut bait and focus your energy elsewhere. Uh, so some projects start off on the great path and then you realize, you know, maybe the data just uh, aren't there. Maybe the results aren't there. Uh, and I think we've all uh, been guilty at some point of uh, some kind of escalation of commitment because we do put so much heart and energy into our projects. But now I'm very mindful of my opportunity cost. So there are many, many things uh, you can be working on instead, whether that be your dissertation, whether that be another project, uh, whether that be, um, you know, reviewing responsibilities. So there's always something else you can be working on. So think about your opportunity costs. A lot of times it's better to cut your uh, losses early and move on to the next big question, next big opportunity. Uh, and finally, failure. We all fail, we fail all the time, and it's time that you start uh, embracing it. I think it's okay to grieve, especially the R&Rs. Uh, at some point, you're gonna have a second R&R rejected that you thought was a slam dunk, and then all of a sudden you get the email, your heart sinks, and you just don't know what to do with yourself for the rest of the day because you just mentally already put it on your CV. Uh, but at some point, it's probably going to happen. I think the important, uh, point is to um, learn how to fall forward. That's a term I borrowed from entrepreneurship research. So a lot of entrepreneurs uh, fail early on. Uh, so not all your ventures are going to be successful. I think the important uh, thing is to learn quickly and learn a lot. So try not to repeat the same mistakes um, and also look for any patterns in your mistakes. So is it um, the inadequate theory that is getting you in trouble? Is it you not thinking through uh, maybe your, the problems with your data that tends to get you in trouble? Uh, I think all of us have our little weaknesses and I think oftentimes uh, you can spot them if you look for patterns and where you tend to fail in the review process. And I think that's why it's important not to put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, another thing that I think is really important to think about early on in your career is managing your re relationships because like we've been talking about, uh, we tend to run in packs. Uh, in our field, very few people work alone. You might work alone on one project, but I don't know anyone who's only had single papers on their whole career. We tend to work together because then we can tackle bigger questions and we can tackle them more quickly. And I think that's important. Um, so these are the four things I'm going to be talking about is finding guides for your dissertation or partners for projects, uh, setting expectations, communicating, uh, and also knowing when to end some relationships. So uh, when you think about a dissertation, I think your committee or your guide, they're not necessarily co-authors. Um, I know that sort of depends on the particular committee. But when you think about looking partners for projects, uh, obviously always think about what skills do I need for this particular task on my team? So who has complementary or necessary skills? Those could be methods, uh, writing, access to a particular data set, or even knowledge of context. 
uh, who's likely to have a similar working style? So this is something I've learned, uh, I guess, the, the hard way through experience is some people tend to work very slowly, some people tend to work fast, some people work in spurts. So I think it's nice when your team works similarly so that you don't run into uh, annoyances when you're trying to go fast and somebody's sitting for a month and then they bug me you all day when you're trying to work on something else. So um, I think you can find out the, um, about this a little bit through word of mouth. People have reputations, obviously prior experience helps, but similar working styles definitely uh, make collaborations easier. Uh, I also tend to work with people that I enjoy as colleagues and as people. So I have published with close friends. I've published uh, with colleagues that I just enjoy interacting with. Uh, so I think having some good social rapport is also really helpful because those meetings also become fun kind of social interactions. Uh, think about what else you're hoping to gain other than an expertise or a particular skill. So I tend to be fairly learning oriented and I have sought out working with people that I thought I could learn from. So uh, for example, if you're junior, senior scholars are typically a lot better at the craft of writing. I think it's really helpful working with somebody who's a skilled writer because if you pay attention to how they craft manuscripts, I think you can learn a lot. I think that's a skill that takes a long time to develop, many years. Uh, so I think you can seek out these uh, learning opportunities as well. And think about how many co-authors is too many. Uh, there are some disciplinary differences. I've learned the number that I'm comfortable with, that I think is kind of the optimal, I think it's sort of a U-shaped uh, relationship in terms of the optimal number of partners on a project and uh, kind of deficiency. Setting expectations, so that's something Dorothy talked about. Uh, what is the intended outlet? We always uh, think about the first one, but I think it's really helpful to talk about the first three. Uh, because if you can't think of three top tier outlets that this project is going to go to, that's a very high risk endeavor. If you only have that one journal um, that you're hoping to go to, I think that's, that's uh, fairly risky. Uh, what is our timeline? Uh, and I think it's helpful to at least start talking about order of authorship early on. Uh, I don't always do this, uh, but at a minimum these days, I like to select a clear lead for the project because otherwise I feel like there's too much diffusion for responsibility and it doesn't move as fast as it needs to. So uh, maybe you don't need to decide who's third, who's fourth, but it help, really helps to have a clear lead on a project. Later on, you're going to have to decide, do we want to present at conferences first? Uh, do we want to get peer feedback and how much peer feedback do we want to get? Uh, some people like very little, some people like to go to multiple people, present at multiple institutions. So I think it's helped to uh, set those expectations. Uh, who's going to handle the submission? Uh, and another big one that uh, I didn't think about early on is how are we going to share the data set that we've created? Uh, does it belong to the lead author? Does it belong to the person that put together the data set? Do we share that equally? Uh, so something to also think about. Uh, how do we communicate? Uh, so how often is important, but especially these days, I think how is also helpful. I would recommend at least some face-to-face, -face, at least in person or virtually. Uh, I think it, it helps um, move the project along. Include everyone on the team. I didn't think I'd have to say this, but I worked on multiple teams where uh, people didn't always include everyone and it created uh, a lot of confusion because something happened and not everyone was looped in. So even if it's just a CC on an email, you don't want to bother someone, just loop them in, make sure they're aware. Um, depending on your division of labor, uh, people can work independently. I often um, say on my project, let's divide and conquer. I'm very like task oriented. So we divide things, people get things done, but any big decisions should happen together. So if we decide to expand our data set, if we decide that uh, a particular theory maybe isn't working, we need a different theory to help explain the phenomenon, these decisions should be made together, I think. Uh, do not disappear of the face of the earth. I know we all have lives and things happen. Uh, so just like in any personal relationship, just communicate if you have trouble or you're sick, your child is sick, uh, something's happening with work. Uh, I think people are very understanding. So I think don't disappear, make sure to communicate. 
keep your promises, uh, keep your deadlines. And if you cannot just say so, again, I think just clear communication is key. Uh, and some topics are especially sensitive, so be careful. Things like expanding the team, uh, changing the authorship order. Uh, I think it's certainly uh, okay to talk about these at any point in time. Uh, just be especially sensitive. I've had bad experiences around those as well. Uh, and knowing when to stop. So over time, like I said, I've, I've worked with 25 plus people in eight years, which I think um, is a lot. Um, is a relationship productive or effective? Uh, so some relationships are very effective in, in producing publications, some are less so. Um, especially if it's not as effective, is the relationship healthy for me? So am I um, feeling good about that partnership or is it stressful and is it strained? Is it imposing some cognitive costs on me? If it's not healthy for me, if I'm stressed about either the working style of that co-author, their personality, uh, is change possible? So if it is possible, what are the costs of it? Is it just something simple like saying, you know what, like I really need to track changes on the manuscript. You forget about this a lot of times and it's very hard for me to do work. Um, obviously you'd, you'd phrase it a lot nicer, but if it's something easy like that, um, that's a small cost. Uh, sometimes it's a person's personality. If it's someone whose um, personality just doesn't, doesn't mesh with yours, um, as we know, personality doesn't really change over time. So maybe that's not something um, that is fixable. Um, there are always some costs to severing ties. Uh, so I have left projects doing ongoing work sometimes. Uh, and sometimes after publication. Uh, you need to consider what are my social ties with that person? Uh, is it somebody senior? Um, don't get fooled by some costs. So don't think about, you know, we've put in so much work into this project or this relationship. Just think about what are my costs going forward? Um, I think the important part is to make it a very really friendly divorce. If you come to, to terms with the fact that you need to end the relationship, uh, just make sure to do it uh, in a very kind, very productive way uh, so it doesn't turn ugly. Um, one co-author told me that uh, when I had this meeting where we decided, you know, it just doesn't make sense for us to uh, work together more closely uh, for several reasons. It wasn't even that personal. Uh, she told me afterwards that I should have been a person that like goes around firing people like in that movie with George Clooney because she felt really good about herself after uh, I fired uh, sort of fired her from our relationship. So I think there's ways to do it uh, in a productive way. Uh, but because we do run in packs and we do tend to work together, I think it's really important that the relationships you keep and the people that you, know, you keep around you do make your life better and you make their life better. Um, because otherwise um, it's not fun, the job's not fun. And it's supposed to be fun. Like we have the best job in the world. So just think about who do you want in your life helping you to make that work fun. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. I need to figure out how to share. Go. All right, thank you, Joanna. So, uh, Make sure I'm correct on this. So we go from nine to eleven. Uh, so now, I, I mean, I, I think I would like to do some Q and A's from the group. So I can do this a few ways. Uh, I can either tell you what. Let's let's do this uh, for the participants. If you can think about questions you might have, I also have compiled a list for our our panel today. So I'm going to share my screen. I've sent them to uh, Andrew and. Uh, Joanna, or I sent them to Andrew and Dorothy while Joanna was was, was speaking. Uh, so I'll share these right now, and I'll go ahead and say them for the group, and then for whoever they're addressed to, just go ahead and uh, uh, chime in whenever you want. Uh, it's kind of not ironic, but very fitting that there are a couple of these I maybe can also speak a little bit to. Uh, so let me share my screen right now. All right. Okay, everybody can see that? Okay, so uh, first off, one of the questions was, uh, this first one for Andrew, uh, it's really great to learn in designing our research, uh, the topics you're talking about, but are there any efforts in management scholarship to unearth all the lost research and find a way to re-engage them with practice? So really this question's about 
how do we connect what we do in terms of scholarship to practice? So Andrew, you want to take that one? Ah, there you go. So if I understand the question right, how do I take research that has been done, that has not been used, and to re-engage that with practice? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, so the idea is, I think, uh, probably sometimes, and I can attest this too, that there's a lot of research that we do that never sees the light of day in terms of impact. Uh, on organizations or on employees? Yes, I, I have two responses. One is, well, if it was published, it does provide an opportunity to dig it out with a literature review, and in particular to consider meta-analysis. One of the important things about a meta-analysis is that it takes individual findings from many little projects which individually don't change our thinking or our behavior, but when combined, produce a persuasive body of evidence to suggest an alteration or change of ways of thinking about it. So that once the water is over the dam and uh, the research has been done for good or bad, then a careful meta-analysis may select out those projects, those papers that were done well, but didn't amount to much. The second issue I would point out, though, is, you know, it's a little late to talk about knowledge transfer when the problem was produced the wrong way. So in many ways, for me, the issue that I've been arguing is our problem is not knowledge transfer, it's knowledge production. And if practitioners or other in, uh, um, scholars have not been participating in the formation and the articulation of the problem and the research, or even the models in the first place, it's perhaps a little late to come to them at the end to say, here's what I found, but it doesn't respond to particular needs. Because it never was identified that way. So. I focus on an awful lot of research goes is never used because it was never involved uh, the people who could have used it. I think I think that's that's a great point, Andrew. Uh, you know, a lot of times we forget that our some of our I, I think some of my best questions have come from practice, where I talk to people and find out what is their concern and then we develop that question together uh, and so then working it in tandem you know you kind of put together your expertise as an academic with that of a consultant or practitioner and then you solve that issue I mean I think that's kind of the ultimate precisely yes uh, okay so let me let me kind of pivot here a little bit uh, I think that that addresses a little bit of some of the a couple of the other questions that that mm -hmm. were posed to the group. Uh, let me ask you this. I'll, I'll go ahead and pose this one to Dorothy because I know that she's been thinking about it. So, Dorothy, in your presentation, you talked about uh, building teams, kind of, of researchers. So, one of the questions was, how do you build these many and diverse teams? So, how do we go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, again, it comes back to kind of is it necessary? I wouldn't suggest like everybody needs to build huge diverse teams to do every research project. That's certainly not true. But um, I think it's like, uh, so my lab is squarely in the world of teams research. And so very often just executing the projects require a pretty big team of researchers and, you know, some decent resources to even carry out the projects. Um, so I've, I've kind of always known that throughout grad school and through my first years as a professor. Uh, so it really takes kind of trying out relationships. I thought Joanna's discussion of uh, having friendly divorces is really kind of interesting and helpful mm -hmm. advice. Uh, so certainly, um, 
I, I think as you go through grad school and your first couple of years, doing mini projects with people and kind of seeing what works, uh, seeing what relationships work and what working styles work and what, who has overlapped with you in terms of the way they think about science and that kind of thing. Uh, and from my experience, that doesn't just happen at one or two conferences. I, I personally attend several kind of interdisciplinary or conferences in different disciplines so that I can meet computer scientists and industrial engineers and like various other people that I feel like their expertise is relevant to the kind of research that I want to do. So it's, it's putting yourself out there and meeting people. It's a very social profession, I think. And then uh, trying out many projects to see what works. And then over time, then you can say, okay, well, you know, we published this together and that was really a great experience and we seem to work well together. Let's do something a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So I really think it's like a years long process. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Marcus, could I add a little bit to that too? Certainly, certainly. I mean, because I one of the things that I find really helpful in thinking about how to structure a diverse research team is Conant and Ashby's concept of requisite variety. In other words, design okay. in your team the variety of information and sensitivities you need to communicate with the organization. For example, I've done many studies of organization change. And I often do interviews with uh, top level managers. And I have no problem getting to see them. But my doctoral students do. On the other hand, when my doctoral students are attending operating meetings of uh, first line units. When I attend those meetings, everybody jumps to attention. Oh, my goodness, Professor Vandeven is here. So <laughs> we got to be at our best. And I would never understand how they behave or obtain an ethnographic understanding or a fieldwork observation of what they're doing in the meetings until I left. And I left my doctoral students observe the meeting. So the, the principle I've learned is whenever I'm doing research on a complex organization, which has many different stratified roles and power differentials, I've got to make sure that within my team, I'm working with senior and junior individuals, plus individuals who might be medically inclined and others organizationally inclined and others financially inclined. Because when you talk about a healthcare system, you're always crossing administration, um, medical practice, and insurance, medical financing insurance. And so that is a principle that I have found is critical because otherwise, if you don't build in that requisite variety, you will have myopic, uh, one-sided data on the complexity of the phenomenon you're trying to understand. That's a great point, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so my next question, and so I'll kind of change this question a little bit to kind of fit uh, my perspective too. So as an aside, there was a PW last year at Academy called The Road to Nowhere, and it was all about how you cut ties with authors or projects. Like, so when do you determine when enough is enough? And I see Joanna and Dorothy kind of smiling, because I think we've all experienced something like that. Now, as an aside, I didn't get to attend the PW because we had a uh, my my wife's grandmother passed away at like 102, so I couldn't go. Wow! Uh, but it was it was a great session because it really talked about this idea that, that I had never learned in grad school or even early on in my career, only through uh, very pain, very painful trial and error uh, of of when do I let a project go and not to fall in love with the project and sometimes not to fall in love with my co-authors. Uh, because they're going to change at some point. So with that, all that kind of as a background, one of the questions I think for Jonna is, uh, you know, have you decided to cut bait on a project and, and leave it in which the co-authors were planning to continue? And if so, how did you deal with that process? So, so I actually, um, the last few projects I've left uh, happened exactly that way. So we had um, an R&R, &R, maybe we had a rejection. Uh, and the co-authors decided to go uh, to a journal that I didn't think would kind of help my case, you know, in a few years when I go up full, full professor, hopefully. 
also the like the cost to me of continuing versus the reward any potential reward um just didn't compute uh, and essentially i told them you know i enjoyed i actually did enjoy working with them you know i enjoyed working with you uh, i think it was a good experience uh, but you know i need to focus my energy elsewhere so best of luck just keep me posted you know hopefully that paper gets sub uh, published somewhere still think it's an interesting paper uh, but they're proceeding without me so i think those are uh, probably the easiest when you just kind of say, you know, my sunk costs are what they are, but um, I'm just going to step back, take my name off the project and let you proceed. So I have done this uh, a few times now um, and I think almost never regretted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would, I'm sure we all can have, I have some similar stories to that too. Uh, I think that, well, uh, that kind of relates to a little bit what Dorothy was also talking about, about kind of creating your, your diverse teams of authors and, and co-authors. I think it's important early on to decide kind of where you typically are going to be publishing uh, and try to find colleagues and co-authors that have the same uh, aspirations or objectives so you can have less of these conversations. Uh, because myself too, I've gotten involved in projects with co-authors where I decided things weren't a good fit, either with the co-authors or with where we're trying to target the project, and I've moved on. Uh, and those are very hard conversations to have. A lot of times, in hindsight, I kind of wish I would have figured that up front. And I think we all have different yeah. goals and we all work at different institutions, right? So what's an A to me, maybe, uh, or what's not an A to me might be an A or A minus somewhere else. And I think it's important to keep in mind. So you know, if my PhD student or um, some early assistant professor wants to proceed with the paper because it's still going to help them, it's going to help them establish their name in the field, even if it doesn't go to an AMJ or, or SMJ, I, I think that's fine. I think we just need to keep in mind our different goals. And I think we are pretty understanding of that. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask uh, the next question, which is kind of a, a, a little bit of a different question. Oh, so uh, one of our participants had asked, and I think this can be for anyone, it, do you have any suggestions on how you can explain how to explain your philosophy of science stance in journal articles. Uh, it often seems to be left implicit in many papers. And this could be uh, Dorothy, Andrew, Joanna, anyone. Sure, um, I'll jump in. So I think in a lot of the journals that we might be publishing in as bio psychologists or management researchers, um, a lot of those journals, I think you're right that the whoever posed this question that the philosophy of science is usually like implicit or it's just kind of a, a community norm that people are approaching things in a particular way. So in general, most of us who are adhering to whatever philosophy of science is the dominant perspective in those journals don't really need to explain our stance quite as thoroughly, like the reviewers are not going to be looking for that. However, if you're really approaching it from a, a very different perspective, like social constructionist or that sort of thing, um, then it is, I think, relevant. It's really important to kind of say that early on in the beginning of your intro, define what that means for reviewers who are not informed, and then explain why bringing this new perspective is going to be relevant to answering your research question or advancing science. Uh, so it's just like anything, any area of you know, if you're grabbing some information from like a theory or idea from communications and bringing it into uh, the, you know, research on leadership, then you're going to need to explain what that is and why it's relevant and why it's a novel, helpful contribution. Andy, do you have additional things to say? No, I think you said that very nicely. Uh, the, um, um, Unless you have a further thought that I should speak about here. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Oh, I mean, maybe just articulating how, like, how would you define it? I guess what, for people who are not on the call, like, what are the options even, or? I, I'm sort of at a loss because I'm not exactly sure um, where, where, where to take this. Uh, we could go a long way. So, <laughs> 
um, help help us out, uh, Carlos. Where where do we, Marcus? I mean, where should we take this? So so for the philosophy of science question, uh, I, I think is really Dorothy's main question. Uh, I think it's a tough one uh, because yeah, most articles that we write, we don't get that expansive in terms of what our philosophy of science is. Right. Well, you know. Basically, I, I think a philosophy of science says there are four alternative philosophies of science that are competing for attention and that different communities of scholars engage in. And it is very important to know the different philosophy of science that implicitly underlies the unstated philosophy that you're using. The important point that I see is that the philosophy of science that we adopt is a choice. It is not a default. The choice is between positivism, critical realism, pragmatism, and relativism. Relativism includes a whole family of perspectives like hermeneutics and feminism and critical perspectives that really adopt the perspective that the ontology and the epistemology of work is subjective. So there's no real objective world out there. It is what you make of it. It is interpreted, socially constructed. The, the positivist, of course, is quite different. Agnostic about ontology, but all focused on uh, the objectivity of methodology as uh, clearly measuring things. The pragmatist takes a much more um, consequential stand. The question is, what is the implication? What is the consequence of the question you ask? The meaningfulness of a question or a phenomenon is not determined by its essential nature. It is what you use it for. Does it make a difference? Does it advance knowledge? And finally, the critical realist takes the perspective that there is a real world out there independent of our thought, but our methodology is highly suspect. I take a critical uh, realist view primarily because it is pragmatically a good way to do science. If we did not agree to some external objective phenomena out there, we would not be able to engage in various methodologies of convergent and divergent validity for measurement, for theory building, and for sharing knowledge. None of these philosophies can be proven. They're all assumptions. And so I'm building on the assumption that most of the time a critical realist approach works. But for many subjects, for many topics, it makes sense to me to become a hermeneutist because the meaning of things is determined by its interpretation. That's good, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so I don't know if that takes you any place. <laughs> no, no, no. That I think that's all. I'm one that always likes to sometimes figure out what my philosophy of science is going to be about uh, a question of interest. I mean, I think that's important kind of uh, developmental I, approach that we that we I all do, struggle with. I do too, and I should add that many of the people I grew up with in this field treated philosophy of science as a religion. And that anybody who doesn't practice my religion is doing crap science. <laughs> yeah, and sorry, uh, but that's what I've heard so many times. Uh, okay, well, let me let me let me pivot a little bit and ask your question. I think this is all about time, so I think this is a good question actually for all of us because I struggle with this even even now uh, with this with uh, being stuck at home during COVID with a seven year old, five year old, and a wife. Uh, <laughs> how how we all manage our time constraints. So someone asked, uh, ha, so for someone, for a student who's in their early stages of, of their dissertation or a project, how do they strike the right balance of designing the dissertation, working on the dissertation, trying to be a world-class researcher versus really just getting, getting, getting out there or, or being a, a fourth year student, like how do they find the time to do all that and then also be on the market or whatever other responsibilities they have in life? Uh, and obviously, this is kind of for all three of y'all. Mm -hmm. Well, I could respond. My initial point would be, you're going to have to do that first paper and the second paper and perhaps the third paper for your dissertation. Well, make it add up. 
don't treat them as independent papers. Make them the first papers toward a 10-year, roughly, venture of becoming world-class on something. Second, we are all, quite frankly, already running in packs, but now do it a bit more intelligently. So do it more, perhaps, uh, articulately so that you recognize the importance of talking with others and involving them because the questions that we study are bigger than ourselves. The questions that we study are more complex, so much so that they are not contained within my existing repertoire of discipline, experience, or knowledge. That being the case, if I really want to understand the question, and therefore make a better contribution and a more penetrating contribution, I got to go talk to others who have a different point of view. I don't need to talk to people who are like me. I need to talk to people who are different from me uh, so I can step outside of myself and get to understand the phenomenon. So in short, it is to say, you've got to go through all of these steps anyway, then do them in a constructive, additive way, don't just do them in a diluted way where you flit and flee from one thing to the other and you don't have a thought about how they connect this into a longer term direction. I think, I, I think that's a great yeah. point, Andrew. Uh, go ahead, Dorothy. Oh, I was gonna say, I completely agree. I think uh, this question to me reads as like, how do we, um, so how do we balance these two competing pressures? And I think what Andy's saying and what I completely agree is don't think of them as two competing pressures. Like they're one and the same. Like you should be uh, working on the paper, like your job market paper and a couple of pubs that will make you competitive on the job market should be in your line of research. Hopefully they're not just one off like, oh, I think this is going to land in a top journal. So I'm going to do this, you know, and it's going to take me completely off track of who I want to be as a researcher. Yeah, I'll chime in here and say that's been one of my difficulties in my career. Uh, I think I, probably all of, or many of us start out all over the place. Uh, and so we, kinda have to, <laughs> yeah. we have to find our way. Uh, even to this day, some people, someone that reviews my packet for full professor may say that, oh, I'm too much all over the place. Uh, I think it's okay to have a couple of streams of research, but I think all of us would agree you got you to gotta be an expert in something. Uh, and so it, it's really important to make sure you have a primary focus, focus and you try to weave threads and themes throughout that focus. It can be very broad, that's fine, uh, but you're accumulating knowledge and expertise and intellectual capital. The more you read, the more research you do. Uh, when you do that, it's kind of a, a very inefficient process if you then just completely pivot 100% and do the same thing in another area. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's uh, also, you know, whenever you go up for tenure, one of the metrics of tenure, regardless of where you are, it's kind of, do you contribute to a certain stream? Are you known for something? Uh, so it's important to become known for something. Uh, one of the ways of doing that, I've always, one of my advice I give to, to early scholars and to PhD students is to become an expert, gain a superpower. Uh, and that superpower can be theory, it can be writing, it can be methods, it can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, but people that have superpowers get asked to be on more projects. They get asked to, to network, they get asked to, to collaborate with others. Uh, and so I think it's important to think about your superpower, what is your superpower, build up that superpower, uh, and that's gonna be something that serves as like a magnetism in, in terms of working with others. There was, a one, there was a wonderful paper by Dane in the Academy Management Review some years ago that emphasized it's not just a matter of gaining expertise. The successful scholars are those who also maintain flexibility mm -hmm. because those who are only specializing in gaining expertise but are become rigid in that perspective, they don't really contribute much new ideas. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, Andrew. And we all could probably attest the fact that sometimes you study an area and then that area is done. You know, it, it disappears or everything's been published that can be published. And yeah. so if you can't pivot somewhat, well, then your stream can dry up. I mean, we all know there's certain areas that, <laughs> that this has occurred to. Uh, so now I think it's flexibility, expertise, but yet still being flexible, I think is extremely important. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of just a pivot. It, 
of your broader idea or broader yeah. area? Well, so among those ideas might be to say, okay, I know that I'm really specializing in working in my particular paper area and uh, a slew stream of pa papers, but I also need to regularly monitor and read what's going on in fields adjacent or related to what I'm doing. Second, I also need to be engaging and attending seminars on mm -hmm. subjects I don't care or know about. Third, I should be regularly talking with others in discussion groups or in with other colleagues and with other practitioners and organizations in order to find out what are the issues and problems that they are addressing. Because many opportunities, if you listen, if you listen to these different people, you will come up with many opportunities that do provide the flexibility for moving into related areas to expand your research and expand your world-class competence. Yeah, and to chime in, I think if you take a, a big, like long-term view of your career, you can actually shift your research interests. So it doesn't yeah. look like you're jumping from one project to, to another. So mm -hmm. I'm at this like very, oh, typical mid-career stage. I got tenure a couple years ago. Uh, and at the same time, right after I got tenure, uh, I also became a mother for the first time. So my life changed in a lot of different ways. And that event especially, I think, kind of had me uh, thinking about issues I wasn't thinking about uh, previously. So um, like women's careers and women in the workforce and balancing careers and motherhood. So I started a number of projects that um, I maybe wouldn't have started before tenure because I think they're maybe are risky, a little bit more long term but I'm working on a project on the role of spouses in supporting women's careers. I'm working on a project on breastfeeding in the workplace. I'm working on a project on how mm -hmm. stakeholders are responding differently to male versus female CEOs um, during this COVID pandemic. So I kind of carved out uh, a space allowing me to study something that I'm very interested in and like personally passionate about, but also is related to my prior research because I always studied uh, personal characteristics of CEOs and kind of personal differences and how they influence um, their decisions and their experiences in the workplace. So I can still tie it into my prior research, but I can shift a little bit and study something different. So if you're someone like me that uh, is just interested in a lot of things, uh, just think about your career as an opportunity to kind of space them out so you're not doing everything at once. Very nice. Right yeah, and, and I would I would uh, underline or highlight that our our careers are a marathon; they're not a sprint. Uh, the the more that you accept that and adopt that philosophy, the better off you'll be. Yes, there's a there's time pressures left and right, uh, but in the big scheme of things, those that are more satisfied with their career and that see themselves as contributing the most are ones that take a, a long term view of, of of their career. Yeah, and I think Marcus and Joanna, you guys both, it's, what you just said really addresses uh, this question that I see up here on the screen that was targeted towards me. So I, I mentioned in my slides early on that um, your dissertation, like your one or two or three projects of your dissertation, doesn't have to be your entire research identity. And I do stand by that because lots of us have many sub interests. And, you know, sometimes a lot of times people put on their job talk, like the Venn diagram of your different buckets of your research interests. And your dissertation doesn't have to encompass that entire thing. Like you are not, your dissertation is not who you are. However, dissertation should certainly be part of who you are along your, along your track. Yeah, I have a confession to make in that I never published my dissertation. Uh, <laughs> That's but, so but common. <laughs> but, but, but it did very much define me in terms of my primary uh, expertise area. Uh, and so I, I think that's a very good point. I do think my career would have been easier if I would have published my dissertation. Uh, but but, but that, that to be said, that your, your dissertation doesn't have to define you. Uh, you should use it as an opportunity, as a springboard to, to become uh, well-versed in an area uh, and to help, you know, start your, your, your pipeline because you, that will benefit you more the more likely you do that. Uh, so I think it's a very, very good point, Dorothy. And quite frankly, I don't know if I've been concerned about how I am identified. <laughs> I, let, I let the papers and the topics in the papers define 
what I'm working on, but that doesn't necessarily exclude me. So I started writing about nominal group brainstorming techniques. That was my dissertation. And I did get it published. And that led me then to a series of studies on organization design and assessment, measurement instruments and measuring jobs and work groups and organizations, pretty much like a structuralist would do. And that led me then to another set of studies on early childhood development and the startup of new organizations that lasted for about eight years, which then took me to the, the uh, fourth study that I've been doing has been a study of organizational innovation and change, which I've been doing for the last 25 years. And then engaged scholarship became kind of the methodology section that's added on to the end of my career. So I, I think of myself as doing about four, five major long-term studies, not in terms of longitudinal research necessarily, but they have engaged me for that long across a series of different kinds of papers, projects, and questions. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good point, Andrew, in that uh, I often say that uh, I have a kaleidoscope or chaos uh, model of careers, and that we never, we never, uh, I often talk to first year PhD students and say, I want to study blank. I'm like, that's great, but you're never going to study that long term. <laughs> like, like we, we, all feel, we all have to find our way in terms of what interests us. And we're going to have pivots. We're going to have shocks. We're going to have things that, that, that make us go in new directions. And those of us that are the most successful are ones that are able to kind of deal with those shocks or see those as opportunities in our career. Uh, and I think Andrew's career is a great testament to that in that, you know, we study what we study. Uh, and then we find something else that we like to study and we try to connect the thread between them, but it's sometimes th there's, there's pivots and there's new opportunities and, and that's kind of what makes it a great career. Yeah, uh, but we it. also have to be very, I think, judicious in understanding that if we are in an area and there's nothing else to do, we have to be, uh, uh, vigilant in, 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 in making sure that we stay relevant, uh, and find new opportunities. The only thing I would add, I totally agree, Marcus, is the idea of flexibility as you're going along, the opportunities come to you. Your friends ask, would you be interested in studying X? And if that sort of fits your direction, then all of a sudden you have a new direction opportunity for, for study. Or alternatively, it is to say, while you are engaged in the study, and in our case, my case of early childhood development, they found the need for understanding interorganizational relationships because children cannot be taken care of adequately in a daycare center without connecting to the Department of Education and Department of Health and a host of other social service organizations, including housing. So that in turn then led to a study of interorganizational relationships that I did not anticipate to get into, but did become an area of study for 25 years. Yeah, I think that um, that's why I use the metaphor in my, the title of my talk uh, that research or a career should be thought of as a journey versus yeah. a trip. As a trip is very straightforward, short, A to B, I'm going to become an expert in X, I'm going to take a trip and I'm there. Versus a journey, I tend to think of something that's longer, has more twists and turns, uh, is more unexpected, there may be some scary parts of that journey. Um, usually people are, are along with you, maybe different people accompany on different parts of your journey. Uh, but I think if you think of your uh, research career as a journey, I think it kind of helps you think about how it's a little bit more fluid, less straightforward, um, maybe um, a little scarier, but definitely more exciting than just a boring trip. <laughs> I think that's a, a great metaphor, uh, Joanna, for how to, to best see what we do. Uh, uh, one question that one of the participants asked was, uh, do we have a mechanism where PhD students or uh, interested participants can interact with one another to see if they have common ideas or complementary skills? And so I would like for us to maybe each to kind of address how we find people that have similar interests to us. Nothing like going to a conference. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or <laughs> virtually sometimes. <laughs> There's nothing like asking to be a reviewer for conference papers. And it also uh, leads to asking people who's doing work in this area. I'm just finding amazing that Google Scholar and just Google itself, when you enter keywords, provides you access to an incredible number of people who are working on the subject area of interest mm -hmm. to you. A lot of them are consultants. A lot of them are not scholars, or they may be, but you do get an exposure to divergent, diverse people who are writing about an issue. And of course, a lot of it you dismiss quickly because that's not the direction you're taking, but it is an opportunity for addressing the question of how do you begin to interact with and identify people with common interests and complementary skills? Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, one of the things I always try to tell junior scholars and PhD students is don't be afraid. So once you find out about this community of scholars or you find someone with a common interest, be proactive and reach out to them. If they say no, that's that I, I say no a lot, but sometimes I say yes. Uh, and sometimes, and a lot of times, some of my best collaborators have been ones that I started that conversation, where I said, you know what, uh, I really liked your publication in this, or, or we presented, I have one co-author that we presented in the same session, but we did not have a similar paper, but we had another similar paper, and, and we both had our papers under review through the same AE at the same time, and so we had this kind of a side conversation about our papers, and they both had an emotional aspect to them. Like uh, they both looked at emotions. Mm -hmm. And so from there, that just sparked a conversation about a paper to do a, that kind of brought together our perspectives, but had a common leakage around uh, emotions that are experienced. And so it's just important to, to kind of be brave as I tell my kids all the time. Being brave doesn't mean you're not nervous or have any kind of anxiety about reaching out to someone. Being brave means that you overcome that and you do it anyway. Uh, so I would say just be brave in terms of uh, uh, trying to reach out to potential collaborators. Uh, uh, that has been one of the best things in, in my career that I've done is to be proactive uh, in terms of trying to find people that have a common interest. Uh, because I do, you know, our, our, our field is very uh, insular at times. Sometimes we, we forget to reach out to others or we, we only connect with certain you know, if we did a social network analysis on the density of our teams and our co-author teams, if we don't be careful, they can be very, very weighted. Uh, so it's important to try to reach out to others, to try to expand that network and, and try to learn new ideas, learn new skills in that area. So I interpreted this question too as like whether the research methods division has some sort of mechanism already set up for graduate students to meet each other. Uh, but you know, even if we don't, this could be an opportunity, as Marcus said, to be brave and be the graduate student who starts the Zoom happy hour or makes a Google Doc that lists everybody's contact information and research interests. And then you could start actually making some connections among the different graduate students that are on the call today. I don't know if there's a way that we could send out like the, the email list or something to the, to the grad students that are on the call. Yeah, we can, we can certainly do that for the participants today. Uh, and so I, I do think that, uh, yeah, there's the other side of this is kind of, a, is there a structural mechanism that facilitates such uh, interaction? Uh, and I think that, you know, in a normal year when we have the physical academy, that that's a great mechanism, you know, within your own division, across divisions. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that regional academies, uh, actually, for me, have been a great opportunity. Yeah. Sometimes the, the academy and management seems like this very daunting, uh, monolithic entity where there's, you know, 15,000 people there. Uh, and regional conferences can really be a much uh, less anxiety-inducing endeavor sometimes. Uh, and so I've had some of my best interactions that have sparked uh, collaborations at those much more regional kind of conferences. Uh, so I, th this all harkens back to Andrew's point about being active uh, and be being willing to to keep relevant. Uh, and so the more that you stay engaged in PWs, uh, in small conferences and workshops, the more likely you're going to have those opportunities to interact with people that have a similar interest. And if you organize those things yourself, you say, I'm going to, you know, 
take charge and organize a group on this and have a discussion about it. Yes. You can completely so, do that as a grad student. So you can do that as a grad student, you can do that as a faculty member. So uh, I don't know if, it, I do a lot of work around experience sampling. And I now like have a little group where we meet and talk about experience sampling. I wasn't classically trained in that methodology. I kind of fell upon it, but I took it upon myself to kind of uh, use it as an opportunity to kind of discuss that methodology and that lens with fellow people. Uh, and I would probably argue that maybe Joanna has done some of the same things around some of your qualitative and fuzzy set work too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have about eight minutes left. Let me ask one more question, uh, and then I'll kind of pose it if there's any other uh, last few questions that people want to ask uh, just across Zoom. So one, one question, I think this is a very good question. We've mentioned COVID-19 a few times. There obviously are, are, are data collection and data methodology issues or problems that now have arisen. Like it's hard to collect data in person. So someone had asked, how do we neutralize these COVID related problems in terms of data collection? Does, well, does anyone have any, any, I guess, for those that are collecting data, how do we collect data during these times? Yeah. One thing I would do is not to rely on a single method. Make sure you're using multiple methods. And so many of us are going to be adopting various kinds of survey, uh, Google form types of data collections to complete a questionnaire or survey, et cetera. And uh, to that, I would say at minimum, contact with Zoom or other uh, uh, Skype or other procedures to meet with and organize a group discussion, or at minimum, a telephone conversation and a one-on-one -on -one Skype discussion about the questions you're asking so that you can identify what it is that people are thinking about when you're asking a question. One suggestion I have in terms of becoming capable of engaging with, uh, we talked about interactional expertise. And my suggestion is at minimum, do a pilot study for goodness sake before you actually begin to collect your regular data. Because a pilot study is a method for gaining interactional expertise in order to find out how people understand the questions you ask, in order to find out what they are concerned about rather than what you are concerned about, in order to allow the participants to raise the questions and the issues rather than for you to be just asking your questions that examine your concepts and your theory always make it a learning experience by engaging opportunities for people to find out not what is your agenda but to find out what is their agenda with regard to the topic you're dealing with suggestion i think that's a great yeah, point I, I think dorothy go ahead um yeah so if we're talking about uh, adaptations to COVID and that sort of thing i uh, definitely as Andrew said, don't rely on just one method. Don't, you know, spread yourself. If you're thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur of your own small research business, um, putting all of your resources into one approach is, you know, just bad business practice, essentially. And um, I, we certainly have had a lot of adaptations to the projects that we've got going on right now in my lab. Uh, a lot of what we do is face-to-face put undergraduate research participants into a lab and have them work together as a team. And so that's clearly not okay right now. So we're trying to figure out creative ways of using Zoom to carry out the same research studies, but more having people in separate locations. Um, but then as I mentioned with the project that we've got going where we are conducting surveys with top level managers and middle level managers, uh, we changed the focus of a lot of our survey items to be a little bit more COVID related and how people are adapting, who they're connecting with to figure out what's going on with this crisis situation. Um, just again, so we could add value to the organizations that we want to participate. So we were gonna get a lot of pushback from the organizations as participants if we didn't have anything related to what they're going through right now, if we were just continuing on with our original research questions only. 
yeah, so I think this how is, we're adapting. This is, uh, I was going to say, this is where I think Andrew's point also comes into play in that some of the stuff we've, I've been doing recently, we ask qualitative questions because uh, qualitative questions yeah. and focus groups are a great way to understand a phenomenon that is completely new to all of us. Like we, we, we don't have a database of COVID questions uh, or COVID concerns that people are going through. And so when you have a new area of science or theory to understand that phenomena, we have to ask questions. We have to get in tune with the participants. Uh, and so I think a lot of people, it, the, the good thing about that is it provides very ripe opportunities in terms of trying to address new questions that, are, that, that may come up from these experiences that people are having with regard to COVID. Uh, so I think those are all very important issues. Yeah, I think to reiterate, uh, obviously COVID is a crisis, but if you start thinking about it as an opportunity, what an incredible natural experiment. And like for somebody who's a strategy scholar, these government interventions and shutdowns, like I couldn't have engineered a better experiment to look at how uh, businesses are responding, to look at how male versus female CMOs are responding this differently, to look at how shareholders are responding to them. Um, in addition, there's uh, a lot of government data that's available to it that you could utilize to look at as potential mediators or moderators of interesting phenomena. So I think it's also, um, if you want to make yourself feel better, we all have down days during this pandemic. Uh, think about all the um, positive ways we could utilize this to advance scholarship and to advance practice and to tackle those big questions that we want to tackle. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very great point. Uh, and so we have, let, let me mention that we also have, so we have about two minutes left. Uh, we've covered a lot. I, I've been surprised and also uh, very thankful in terms of all the questions you all have asked in the, in the chat room. So uh, I think with, with I probably won't turn it over to questions from the group as a whole because we only have a couple of minutes and I'm pretty sure the Zoom will will cut out toward the end. Uh, I guess I, I just want to take a, a few moments and just thank all of y'all for being here. Uh, I know there's a, I think there's a, a there's an editable, an editable link uh, to a Google Doc that our participants and I have actually put together about collaborating. So I'll make sure that our consortium committee shares that. Uh, also, uh, as myself, uh, all of our panel members will certainly answer any questions you have offline. You know, uh, we, we can provide you with our information to answer those questions, anything else in that regard. Uh, so I, I do want to thank our panel participants for being here today. That you all have been great. Thank you very much for, for all of your insight. Uh, and as you saw in our slides earlier, uh, your next session is going to be, I can pull it up, oops. I think it's one week from today. Uh, your next session is gonna be Wednesday, June 17th from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, we encourage you to get in early into your meeting room uh, and ask lots of chat questions. Since this is our new new medium for how we, we interact. Uh, and with that, I'll just go ahead and kind of turn it over to Larry uh, and he'll end the session for today, or actually our karma correspondent. Uh, and again, if you have questions, please reach out. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus, for moderating. Great. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you, Marcus. And Dorothy and Joanna. Very nice to do this with you. Yeah, yeah, right. it's great to be with you as well. I've Thank learned you. a lot myself. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All. I guess Larry's uh, not online anymore, but thanks everybody. Uh, have a great day. Yeah, thank you, Dorothy. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank, thank you, Bye-bye. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Joanna.